Welcome back to another special episode of Organic Chemistry, and today we're going to talk about five surprising reactions. So my research involves sulfur and fluorine. I've talked about this a little bit on the channel before, but it's going to be more relevant today, and you're about to see why. Most of my chemistry has involved thiocarbonyls, and this specific episode we're going to be talking about reactions that surprised me by producing interesting products. Hopefully they'll surprise you too. So this first one is this chloroformate. This is kind of a weird product, and you're going to see why. So it is well known in the literature that primary and secondary alkyl halides can occasionally be substituted with silver 1 fluoride. This works just because silver halide is precipitated. Silver chloride, silver bromide, and silver iodide tend to be very poorly soluble, and so you can often just precipitate them out, and the silver can come along and coordinate to the halogen and make it a better leaving group. However, this doesn't always work well, so don't get you know too carried away thinking this will so suddenly solve all your fluorination problems. It probably won't. And so my research is focused on the conversion of thiocarbonyls to CF2s. And the reason that this works is silver is a soft Lewis acid and sulfur is a soft Lewis base. And so silver would really like to form silver sulfide if possible. So for most of my stuff, I've had some sort of system like this where I have one oxygen, a thiocarbonyl, and then some sort of other group. Now, what we had proposed is perhaps if we had something like this, we would be able to just displace the chloride to get a fluoride. However, maybe we can make an OCF3 this is a motif that's present in a lot of pharmaceuticals, and so this would be something really useful if we could do that. It could also be possible that only the sulfur would be substituted, and you'd have like a CF2Cl, or maybe only two fluorines would add, and the sulfur would still stay. But it wasn't really clear what would happen. So we tried out this experiment, and what ended up happening is something that we did not expect, which is just conversion of the sulfur to an oxygen, just probably through hydrolysis with the glass. Now, the chloride didn't get touched. If I wanted to make the light green compound showed here, I'd have to do this using a different method. And I talked about this in my worst smelling chemicals video. And if you haven't seen that, I'll put a link to it here. Now, the next compound is this interesting looking triflate derivative. Now, you might think uh, a triflate is typically a good leaving group. It doesn't really want to be on carbon at all, but that's not necessarily the case. It entirely depends on adduct stability. So like I was saying, I've been trying to replace the the thiocarbonyl with fluorine to make a CF2. And so one of the things I wanted to do was take dithiobenzoic acid, treat that with silver fluoride, and get trifluorotoluene, because this would be an interesting way to install CF3 groups. Now, unfortunately, while this does work, it only works a tiny little bit, and it only works on aromatic dithioacids. It doesn't work on cyclohexane dithioacids. And uh, it's not a clean reaction at all. You get all sorts of different products. Partially, the sulfurs convert to oxygen, the fluorine adds on or doesn't add on, all sorts of messy stuff happens with dithioacids. So that wasn't that great. And so one of the things I thought to do was maybe I could uh, add some additives in. And you can see why this doesn't work as they show here. So first, the silver fluoride will just displace this uh, SH group so that you get a thio thiocarbonyl fluoride. This thiocarbonyl fluoride can then have another silver fluoride attack, and it will form this intermediate and what kind of has to happen, but doesn't really want to happen, is elimination of silver sulfide and formation of this difluorobenzylic carbocation. Now, carbocations are typically not stable. This is a primary carbocation, although it's benzylic, so that wouldn't normally be too bad. But because there's two fluorines there, that makes it a very unstable carbocation, so that's kind of challenging to form. Now, that being said, I was able to form some trifluorotoluene, so it does work, but just barely. We're really fighting... Uh, we're really fighting the physical chemistry to get it to form. And so the reason that the oxygen derivatives work so well is instead of having a carbocation like this, you have an oxygen-containing group, which is electron donating, and that stabilizes the carbocation. And so in some experiments I did with mix, mixes of silver salts, such as silver triflate, I was actually able to form this intermediate carbocation, and surprisingly, a triflate is able to stabilize a benzylic carbocation like this. So while you might think of a triflate is a better leaving group than a fluoride, there's still some electron density back donation to stabilize carbocation, as I was able to form this CF2 containing triflate in over 40% conversion. Now, this also worked for several other silver salts, although in varying yields, but you know, non-trivial yields. So this is kind of interesting. Unfortunately, these products weren't that useful, so we never published it anywhere. This is where I'm publishing it right now. So the third compound is this interesting sulfoxide. And the lesson I learned here is sulfonyls can do what carbonyls do. And so what I was trying to do, this is one of my undergraduate projects, 
uh, when I was an undergrad, I was working on this. I was trying to take this aryl triflate and essentially just delete the SO2 photochemically and convert this to an OCF3. It's conceivable that you could cleave that oxygen sulfur bond into two radicals and that that could generate a CF3 radical and that they could recombine. Um, and so unfortunately I was able to do this, but my optimized conversion after several weeks of working on this was a 4% conversion. And so the other reactions that ended up happening include just the deletion of an oxygen. So photochemically, it just zaps off an oxygen and you get this sulfinate. Additionally, I eventually determined that the sulfinate was undergoing some sort of reaction to make this ortho substituted uh, sulfoxide. And I could generate the sulfinate essentially just deletion of an oxygen at an optimal yield of 22%, which is a little bit low still. And depending on the photochemical conditions, other products could be formed. And so the formation of this red thing actually goes through something called a photothiophorize rearrangement. And so when I looked in the literature, a thiophorize rearrangement had been reported with a Lewis acid, but unfortunately it was published in a really low impact journal. So this would likely be an even lower impact as this isn't a clean reaction. This isn't a reaction people really care about. Um, but it still follows that, you know, a Fry's rearrangement is the same sort of thing, but with an ester, and this can be done photochemically or with a Lewis acid. If you have PETE bottles that typically yellow if left in the sunlight, the reason that they turn yellow is through this exact reaction, through the photo Fry's rearrangement. But in this case, this is a thia Fry's because this is a sulfonate instead of a, instead of an ester. Okay, so the next compound is benzoyl fluoride, and you might think, well, that's not a very interesting molecule. I'm not sure why this was even included in here. But let me tell you, this is probably the most interesting reaction that I saw in my entire PhD. And let me tell you why. So I was reacting bromoacetophenone with silver one salts and trifluoromethoxide quaternary ammonium salts. And so one of the things you can do with quaternary ammonium trifluoromethoxide salts is you could substitute primary iodides to get OCF3 ethers. However, the OCF3 can decompose and use fluoride as a nucleophile. And for whatever reason, this is actually a better fluoride source than uh, fluoride is. So this will, this will make terminal fluorides very easily. Now, the weird thing was for alpha bromo ketones and alpha bromo carbonyl containing compounds. So like instead of a benzene ring, I had derivatives where I had a nitrogen with some R group sticking off of it. And the same reaction happened where we somehow cleave a carbon-carbon bond, delete a CH2 and make an acyl fluoride. Now I have no idea how that forms but this is consistently occurring even with different silver salts, um, even with different quaternary ammonium salts. Somehow there's some unknown reaction that just deletes a CH2 and forms an acyl fluoride. If any of you have any idea how this could form, I'd appreciate a comment in the comment section. Otherwise, if you think a longer discussion would be productive, you could join the Discord, which will be linked in the description, and you could discuss it with me more there. And so I confirmed by GCMS and NMR that this is in fact forming like 124, it's the exact mass of benzoyl fluoride. And I made benzoyl fluoride countless other times with an identical retention time. So I 100% know for sure benzoyl fluoride is forming. And I know that the bromoacetophenone is like pure. Now, the interesting thing is I made some iodoacetophenone just with sodium iodide, and we got more conversion to the the uh, fluoroacetophenone and the trifluoromethoxyacetophenone, but there was still some of this happening a little bit, but I'm not sure why specifically the bromide had this issue and the iodide didn't. So this is an interesting mystery, and this is probably the only extent I'm ever gonna get to uh, talking about it. Okay, so this also happened with carbon oil derivatives, like I was saying. Now, last but not least, this interesting guy. So just because it's a bad nucleophile doesn't mean it's not a nucleophile, it's still a nucleophile. And so, I had made this salt right before the COVID lockdown had happened, and it turns out that I hadn't gotten rid of all the diethyl ether in the reaction mixture. So I had precipitated this from a solution of diethyl ether, but you know, it's a little bit reluctant to fully boil off. I guess they didn't high vac it long enough to get rid of any solvent. And so uh, there was some trace amounts of ether in it, and this was just sitting with it for several months after COVID happened. And so the appearance of the product initially was like white, but it turned red within a day because these things just tend to turn red but it turned into a black oil. And so when I went to go analyze it, I already knew it was a bad time because black oils are typically, you know, a sign of decomposition. And so I did an NMR and it turns out that uh, this just formed this ethyl orthoester as well as ethyl triflate. And you can see the mechanism of this reaction is just diethyl ether is an oxygen nucleophile. And so it can attack at this carbocation 
and then this is an activated oxonium that can undergo nucleophilic attack by triflate to form ethyl triflate as well as this ethyl orthoester. So this is kind of a surprising reaction because this electrophile tends to only react with nucleophiles that are about as reactive as indole, maybe slightly less reactive than indole would be okay. But diethyl ether is a terrible nucleophile compared to like indole. So this is a really surprising reaction. And so hopefully this has been an entertaining video about some reactions that didn't do what you might expect. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, I encourage you to leave them below. And it would really help out the channel if you left a like and subscribed. Have a great day.